Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Bruce Lowry. I'm with the, the Skoll Foundation, and um, thank you for all coming to this session on feeding 10 billion on a, on a warming planet. Um, this is going to be talking about, as the title suggests, uh, you know, how do we feed a growing population without sort of exhausting Earth's natural resources and blowing through planetary boundaries. Um, and with that, I would like to hand it over to my friend, um, Deborah Dunn, who's a Skull Foundation board member and also, also the co-founder of the Feed Collaborative at Stanford University, who is moderating this panel. Thank you, Bruce. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for getting up this morning and showing up for the morning session. We are currently in a bit of a global downward spiral when it comes to food. We'll need lots more as the world's population continues to grow, but even at today's levels, the production of food is one of the biggest contributors to global climate change and to the overall environmental degradation that we're facing, and that's compromising our ability to produce food. So we need more, and if we keep doing what we're doing, we're gonna be able to produce less. On the human health side, Almost a billion people lack, insufficient, lack sufficient food today. And on the flip side, almost two billion people are obese. We've also moved toward so-called modern diets that account for up to 11 million premature deaths per year around the world. So this is a very big topic the good news is it's getting growing focus. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to look up the Eat Lancet report, which recently came out, giving interesting coverage to all facets of this globally. But when you dig beneath the surface, the particulars vary quite widely between countries, as you would expect. And this discussion is going to zero in particularly on the Global South we'll particularly focus on Africa and India with a little bit more depth. In Africa, between 70 and 80% of the food is still produced by smallholder farmers, and about a quarter of the population is food insecure. The climate change impacts in Africa are particularly severe because of the geography, and population growth is projected to be particularly high in Africa, with the population potentially doubling by 2050. This is a looming crisis in terms of food security, but also in terms of the livelihoods of the world's, some of the world's most vulnerable people, as they are smallholder farmers. Similarly, in India, around 70% of the food is produced by smallholders. Food security is not as severe there, estimated around 15% of the population. Population growth is also not projected to be quite as high, but still significant at 25% between now and 2050. And similarly, India will disproportionately experience climate impacts because of their coastal areas as well as being in the south. Many big food organizations advocate the adoption of large-scale industrialized approaches that have been used in countries like the US. And while those have very successfully scaled up production and reduced the cost of food while using less land, the environmental and human health costs of that approach have been enormous. And a lot of farmers have been taken out of farming work as farms have become larger, more mechanized, et cetera. So we have a tiny fraction of the number of people employed as farmers, which is good if you have alternate jobs, but in countries like Africa and India would not be a good outcome. So while there are clearly some innovations that can be leveraged, wholesale adoption of those approaches would be disastrous if that were pursued on a global basis. This may seem like a hopelessly vexing problem, which makes it a great topic to explore under the heading of accelerating possibility. 
We're lucky to have three extraordinary <coughs> people on our panel today who have been motivated to find solutions to these problems. And I'd like to start by learning a little bit more about what they're each why they're each focused on this challenge and what they're working on to try to solve it. So we'll start with Willie Foote, who is the founder of Root Capital, a nonprofit social venture that invests in the growth of agricultural enterprises supporting smallholder farmers. And Willie also has the distinction of being a long-term school social entrepreneur. So Willie, tell us a little bit about why and what. And this, this is an opportunity for all of you to practice your succinct elevator <laughs> pitch. So great to be here. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I'd say there's two key questions to, that we're trying to tackle this morning. One is, as you suggested, growing a lot more food sustainably under increasingly difficult climatic conditions. And the other one is creating um, functioning markets that can deliver that food to, say, Africa's rising growing population, uh, but also that can improve income so that, especially in rural areas, families can actually afford and obtain adequate nutritious uh, food. So uh, against that backdrop for the past 20 years, uh, our organization, Root Capital, has invested in the growth of agricultural businesses so they can transform rural communities in sub-Saharan Africa as well as in Latin America and in um, in Southeast Asia. Uh, think of a local enterprise that's maybe purchasing and exporting uh, coffee from hundreds of farmers in Eastern Congo, but more relevant for this conversation, uh, say a woman-owned business that's sourcing and processing sorghum, maize, cassava, uh, in order to make you know, affordable, nutritious foods available to local families. And we believe that those businesses are really well positioned to really address both of the challenges, questions that, that I highlighted. Um, why? Because they can provide inputs, training, resources to make or to farmers so that they can improve their production sustainably and they can at the same time connect farmers uh, to markets and thus increase their income. And so, Deborah, I mean, we've, uh, there's no question that for the for the places and the people that we work with, uh, climate change has become an existential uh, crisis. Um, smallholder farmers are absolutely on the front lines of our changing uh, climate. And the challenge is not just, uh, not only coping with climate calamity like uh, Cyclone Edai, uh, so devastating in Mozambique and beyond recently, but really ensuring that farmers and especially the most vulnerable women, young people, indigenous people have access to the information and the skills and the capital they need to adjust to the changing uh, climate. And, but here's the rub. Farmers are not necessarily going to get there on their own. And so um, back to what we're doing at Root Capital, I would say as a proxy for the smallholder agricultural finance industry is um, thing one. These businesses uh, can proactively help farmers to invest in climate smart agricultural practic practices. So think the right <coughs> seeds and plant varietals that are disease and drought resistant. Uh, keeping more trees on the landscape through better shade you know, management and agroforestry practices. Um, crop diversification where the crop can no longer grow given the rising temperature or in, the, in that altitude of the agroecological uh, conditions. And then just lastly, what at Root Capital we can do is on the one hand lending to amplify these efforts, so pay the farmers well and on time, lending long term for um, plant nurseries, for irrigation, for um, centralized composting plants, water saving, processing facilities, uh, disease, far farms that are diseased that can be renovated. We do direct technical assistance, and I'll get to my key point for today's conversation really. Direct technical assistance where say we're training agronomists that are extension workers within the farmer business to address urgent threats like climate dis diseases tied to the wording of the weather. But I'd say what we're really focused on now is through bundled services, if you will, through partner-enabled technical assistance, working with the climate science community, with the digital ecosystem, disruptors there, and with, with complementary capacity builders 
to really bundle the services way beyond what we can do ourselves in order to, as I said, enable access to information and the skills and the capital that farmers and their businesses really need to adapt to this new reality. Great. I particularly like your term, the weirding of the weather. Yeah, right. That's what we have to say in DC these days. <laughs> Agnes. <laughs> Our next panelist is Dr. Agnes Kalabata, president of AGRA, which stands for the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. AGRA's goal is to increase the incomes and improve food security for 30 million farming households in, in 11 African countries by 2021, using an African-led farmer-centered partnership driven across and an across-sectors approach. Agnes, tell us a little bit more about what you're up to and why is this problem something you're spending your time on? So, um, thank you. Uh, Agra exists, the way I look at it, Agra exists for only two reasons. One, that Africa can, in the, the hope that Africa can one day feed itself and sustainably feed itself. Two, that African smallholder farmers can function as businesses as opposed to subsistence farmers that are caught in poverty. Those are the two reasons that really influence and inform what we do. So the way we, we work then at Agra is we look at the type, we, we, we work with businesses at the bottom of the pyramid in the business environment. <coughs> we work with the private sector in the farming landscape to ensure that we are reducing, reduce the distance to the farmer. So, the farm, so that these farmers have access to technologies that are critical to improving yield, have access to markets that are critical to improving <coughs> yield. And when I'm talking about technologies, Agra foc uh, has focused on, on, on really taking products from the CG centers, good seeds, and really bringing them to the African landscape and ensuring that these good seeds are localized, are adapted to the local environment. So we use scientists that take these technologies and working with national research centers, really ensure that we have the right varieties of seeds that farmers can, can, can grow and double or triple their yields. Very critical to this is the business environment for that to function. You need the businesses that will produce the seeds, but you also you need the business that will retail, will retail the seeds to farmers, or in, in sometimes also, uh, we are talking also about fertilizers, and being able to do the appropriate research to ensure that we understand the fertilizers that are needed in di different landscapes that farmers are working in. So doing this type of things is very critical to ensuring that farmers have varieties that are responsive to climate change. Uh, in, and in this case, there are several varieties now that are uh, of, of the things farmers are growing that are respons responsive to climate change, but also have the ability to give them more yields that are using all sorts of blended types of fertilizers that farmers are more aware of the type of fertilizers they can use, not to pollute the environment, but really to ensure that they are producing the crops they need without polluting the environment. And the, with all that, for that and that to happen and ensure that farmers are operating as businesses, we need functional markets. We need farmers to have choices. And so, so really, we, we are trying to, make, to create an ecosystem that allows farmers to access the right seeds, access the right fertilizers, but to also have choices around what they grow because they need it or what they grow because there's a market for it, and then they can buy what they need. So Agra's job is really two in those areas. We c help create the businesses that reduce the distance to the farmer. So we provide, we are a retail grant maker, and we, we, we provide small grants that these businesses can handle, and we ensure that they are growing and they are becoming accountable. Then we get resources from uh, philanthropists, from institutions that want to fund these landscapes, and we are sure, <coughs> or we ensure that these resources are put to use the right way. So really our job is twofold. Create the businesses and ensure that they have the ability to grow, and two, create the accountability mechanisms back to our funders so that they feel sec secure in terms of how they on, loan, on lend to farming communities. So really ensuring that the agricultural landscape is growing, the businesses in the agricultural landscape are growing, that farmers are becoming businesses themselves in an environment where people who are funding them feel secure to put their, sources, their resources out there. So we now superimpose Work with, working with the governments, recognizing that the easiest way to scale businesses in the farming landscape is really to take advantage 
of what is happening in the government <coughs> because governments have lots of resources. So now we are saying, how do we strengthen the capacity of governments to also use their own resources to quickly scale to millions of people that we can't reach? That's why we have the audacity to shoot for 30 million farmers in the next two to three years. Because we know that if we find the right government that we can work with, we can actually be able to scale what we are doing very quickly. So that's, those are the things we focus on. Excellent. Yeah, and we you. appreciate your audacity because <laughs> we need that yeah. level of impact, definitely. I think for folks in the US, it's important to realize that in places like Africa, actually the government has a lot of power and a lot of money. So working with, with the government is a tool. I think we're starting to be trained to think government doesn't have any power or money, mm -hmm. um, which is not a global phenomenon. Usha. Mm, thank Dr. you, Deb. Usha's there is director and CTO of MAKO, which is Maharashtra Hybrid Seed Company in India. Their mission is to protect the present agricultural face of India from the challenges of the future by strengthening farmers with the best of technology and innovation. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so the question as to who will feed uh, the growing population. So clearly to me and to, uh, for our organization, it's the smallholder farmer. Uh, smallholder farmer will, uh, does today and will continue to feed the growing population in India and I feel also in Africa. So when you think about the smallholder farmer, uh, what is important for the smallholder farmer? Number one priority is to improve their own livelihoods, incomes. How can they increase their incomes? And until we address that point of improving their livelihood, the farmer who doesn't have too much disposable income to make choices otherwise is not going to be able to contribute to, to the overall agenda. So the livelihood of the smallholder farmer is the center of the focus at our organization. Um, what is it that we do um, uh, as a business? Uh, because I work in the seed company uh, and we primarily provide uh, seed solutions to the farmer. But to the smallholder farmer, an average customer who buys our seed plants less than one acre of the high quality seed. Uh, and that is their average land holding in many, many cases. So when we talk about the smallholder farmers and the company uh, from a commercial perspective, our focus has really been on how do we look at innovation and technologies which provide value to the farmer. We've done this in multiple different ways. A seed, of course, is the key component where we look at how do we provide climate-ready seed. So if we take an example of wheat, for instance, we have growing te uh, increasing temperature at the time of flowering or grain filling. If we don't have heat-tolerant varieties which the farmer can plant and harvest, the farmer will have no output uh, to take to the market. So this is uh, one example of how we can look at having climate ready crops which the farmers uh, will plant and have something which they can harvest at the end of the year. The second point that um, <coughs> in addition to the seed, uh, productivity is always an important element because without having productivity, uh, the farmer cannot sustain themselves. So how do you increase uh, productivity in this warming climate? One of the other big challenges is pests and diseases. So as the climate is warming, uh, the incidence of diseases is increasing. So one of the key objective uh, in our organization is how do we make sure that the varieties or hybrids that we sell to the farmers are disease resistant or tolerate the pests better. Um, one of the other elements that we work on is uh, improving soil health. And while improving soil health, also improve uh, plant productivity. So uh, typically when we think about soil health from a microbial perspective, the first thing that comes to mind is nitrogen fertilizer fixers like rhizobium. But now we have a, a whole basket of microbes which actually um, render a plant drought tolerant, uh, can fight some diseases. And this is one of the things which has become much more um, acceptable to the farmer in the last five to 10 years that we see where farmers are applying either directly in the soil or uh, coating it on the seed and then planting the seed. This has of course a positive impact on the soil because you're 
uh, enriching the microflora in the soil, but also improving the plant health as well as plant productivity. The third thing that I wanted to uh, talk about is a small scale mechanization. One of the key challenges, um, and I think uh, for many of us, uh, it's not always very clear, but farming is hard work. <coughs> And it's uh, what we call the drudgery, uh, you know, so no uh, young person wants to stay in farming if they have other options. Uh, they would rather go to, go to the city and do something else. And looking at this situation, uh, we're really wanting to have small scale implements, uh, which uh, starting from planters, uh, plows or uh, harvesters, which can actually enter the small fields. Because if we look at the large wheat harvester that you uh, see pictures of, which look very nice, but the smallholder farmers don't have even access for such implements to go into their fields to help them with what they need to get done. So the small scale mechanization, we feel improves the life of the farmer uh, in terms of uh, the work that they need to do and also has a positive impact in terms of a farmer's willingness to also uh, adapt uh, conservation technologies if they have mechanization possible. Thank you. Great, so you're all working either with smallholders or with intermediaries, in Willie's case, who work with smallholders. Uh, I'm curious about whether you see a role for a big ag or a big food in solving these problems, and if so, what is that role? I guess uh, from where we are sitting as Agra, this is something actually that we are very deliberate about. We have created a whole department to think about how we work with big business. And, and why do we care about that? So uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, we are working with small businesses that serve smallholder farmers, but we also know that these businesses have very little understanding of how the rest of the world works. So if you want to tap into global value chains that, um, really working and ensuring that, that the supply chains become sustainable, we need to tap into the, these global businesses. But we also look at capital flows. So it's good to have um, institutions like Root Capital that is worried about how uh, communities access funding, but we also look at how businesses themselves bring funding into the farming landscape because they want to fund how the, Many of them are interested in sourcing from smallholder farmers. Right. So it's really how we de-risk. We are so passionate about de-risking businesses and how they work with smallholder farmers, recognizing that the capital flows that they will bring will can actually have huge potential to fund farming itself. And, and really, we are beginning to see a lot of this in terms of how uh, um, some of these businesses like Nestle, like um, uh, you know, many of the businesses that are in the food industry that want to work with smallholder farmers. So we're really uh, very intentional around <coughs> what is it that, what will it take for you to be an, in an extra market in Africa? What will it take? Is it an understanding of the political landscape? Is it a better understanding of the risks around smallholder farmers? Mm -hmm. Is it a better linkage to the businesses that operate in the smallholder landscape? And what we've done, we've done two things. Mm -hmm. One. We've started creating what you call consortia, a consortia, or what you would call an ecosystem of players in the farmer's landscape, which ecosystem helps bring knowledge, bring technologies, the, the technologies being good seeds and fertilizers, uh, into the farming landscape, but also provide visibility of the markets to farmers. Most of the businesses on the African continent, uh, in terms of the, the businesses that are adding value, up operating at 40% capacity, and they'll tell you, oh, we don't have enough volume. But farmers also at the same time don't have markets for their produce. And the disconnect between the supply and demand just makes the whole system dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. So by building this consortia, we actually provide an opportunity for everybody to mm -hmm. understand everybody else's needs. And for us, the hope is that these big businesses then take advantage of that ecosystem we have, we, we have, we have created and don't feel the need to go on the ground themselves. I keep telling big businesses, you don't need land, you need produce. We have smallholder farmers that are ready to give you produce. So purchase from smallholder farmers. And, and we've really create, tried to create an ecosystem that allows smallholder farmers to be part of an ecosystem that can fit into big businesses and how big businesses then have an opportunity to work with, 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 with these farmers. And that's the kind of landscape we'd like to see. So we completely believe they have 
a huge responsibility. And we believe they can do very, very well, doing a good job on the ground as well. Yeah, you wanted to ask? yeah but just to build on that, um, I, I was in northern Ghana last week, and we were building on one of these consortia that Agnes is talking about. So was, we were about four hours from Tamale in a place called Geiru, where we're working with an aggregator of sorghum farmers, 3,000 farmers, 70% women, and they are selling to Diageo. So back to it's not really global versus local. It's how do you link global with local or local right. with global. So they're selling into Diageo. They've gotten the right seed recommendations from Diageo, which is Guinness. Mm -hmm. And um, we were doing, we had a round table discussion with Diageo, with Yara, with Agra, and others basically coming up with what's the right financing structure, which we've actually already done, but we wanted to like test it and do more of it, input financing. So that when you have the right seeds, you have the right uh, mm -hmm. plant or soil health product, you've got to get it in the right dosage, in the right way, to the farmers on time. And we were able to do that uh, two years ago, a first pilot. So scaling that up is entirely about embedding into this ecosystem that's been created, which is Yara and Diageo, big global companies. And one other, just a plug, there's a wonderful organization that some of you will know called P uh, Partners in Food Solutions. So kind of going from the production level to the agri-processor where it's eight of the biggest agri-food companies in the world, including uh, uh, General Mills and Hershey and so on, and they're providing pro bono volunteer um, support in food processing and food safety standards for agri-processors across Africa. We work very closely with them, and so you're basically taking kind of a paunch core of folks who've been making <coughs> processing foods in the Midwest of the United States for 30 years and providing really bespoke um, knowledge around, okay, if you're going to buy that, you need an extruder for that soy oil, edible soy oil. You need this manufacturer at that capacity, at that price, and this is how you met you. And we could never do it by ourselves. It's really because of these big global companies who've, who uh, were inspired by Kofi Annan to figure out how they can play a role in feeding the future. Great. Okay. I'd like to flip to technology because certainly in the global north, food tech has become a huge thing. I live in the Silicon Valley. There are tons of food tech startups of all kinds. Um, big focus on precision agriculture, which is a very promising area. So I'm interested in understanding what, what technology developments are you able to either leverage or create based on some of what's going on that apply more relevantly to the specific problems. So Willie, I want to start with you. And I know that you've done a lot regarding delivering mobile advisory services, also <coughs> leveraging the many smartphones that are out there among farmers. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the things you're doing? Sure. And the challenges of doing more. Yeah, and I'll say, I, I say it humbly because relative to the scope and the footprint that an agra has, we're just kind of a transactional player down in the weeds trying to create evidence base, et cetera. So, um, but so I'd say the first thing is, um, and we talked about this earlier this morning, how do you marry um, micro data, field data collection with big data analytics? And that's really where the, where the revolution has happened in big ag in the United States and beyond. How do you do that? So for us, we have what we call our mobile advisory services, where we've been working a lot with uh, upwards of 40 clients now on digitizing farmer level data collection. And that's basically tablets um, with extension workers and beyond to digitize so that you can actually track and send it straight up to the cloud. What are the plant varietals that they're using and inputs? Uh, what's the uh, agricultural agronomic practices? Uh, what's the yield and productivity data so that then, back to the topic of today, when you do, when you work with, say, the Climate Science Committee and you downscale climate mapping data at a hyper-localized yep. basis, you have to know what those coordinates are and the data is on, like, at the individual farmer level. Right. So that's kind of step one is digitization of farmer level data collection. Um, and from there, you can basically participate in the digital harvest and the digital ecosystem. Another thing I just quickly uh, mention is in Africa in particular, many of the agro-processors and aggregators don't have extension teams. They don't have enough margin to have a bunch of agronomists on staff. So how do you leverage smartphones to get, in the case of, say, there's a 
particular disruptor we're working with called AWARE, A-W-H-E-R-E, which is weather forecasting kind of weather alerts that go out to farmers and say, you know, you need to hold off for two weeks on planting or, or putting your fertilizer down because it's gonna, there's gonna be a torrential downpour or something. And that you can overlay on that agronomic tips that go directly to the farmer. And just lastly, again, last week in Ghana, we were talking about this over breakfast, Agnes and I, Kwapa Koko, um, a farmer's union, is a very large uh, co-op outside of Kamasi in Ghana, in southern Ghana. And we were there, and we provided support for the first 250 smartphones for this, uh, a project which is called the Tela Agric Center. And you had farmers from all over central um, Ghana calling in to a call center with a bunch of young agronomists and it looked like something you'd find in India, uh, you know, in, 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 in normal call centers. And they're asking questions around termites in their tree, in their plants, uh, spacing of trees, and so on. And it was remarkable. We were there for an hour, and there are 25 calls that came in. And if they have to escalate it from there or elevate it, then the, the agronomist at relatively high cost goes out four hours away in their motorcycle. But otherwise, there are about 80% of the issues that can be captured, I mean, can be addressed right there. And then they have, a, they have a digital record of every single conversation. And our friend Jeffrey Sachs at Millennium Promise Alliance is using that research to then develop artificial intelligence around what's going on in the tele. So these are super cool things, but like as I say, we're only involved marginally in this. We're just getting started. So add some of the things that Agra's doing in this space. Yeah, thank you. Um, I used to work in the government before I came to Agra. So one of the things that I, I had to do at the end of every season was to do what we called crop assessment. And crop assessment is where you send out hundreds of people, enumerators, to basically go and visit uh, selected farms. We, we, we would aim for about 30% of the farms countrywide. So just think about 30% of the farms countrywide. And one is uh, the far average farm size is 0 0.3 of a hectare, so hundreds of farms to be touched and reached within a period of one month so that you can have a sense of what you're going to have at the end of the season and how to make projections <coughs> within your economy so that you can be able to plan what to do the next season. Now, that's something during the last AGRF, AGRF is a, is a, a, conference, in, uh, in a conference we have in Africa, it's a huge conference, brings the whole of the agricultural landscape in Africa together in one place. During the last AGRF, we had like 30 ministers come in one place and they agreed on one thing, that they need support and help with data and how to get data together. And I could relate to that because that's exactly how I felt. So we have just gone into a partnership with a startup that actually comes from Stanford University, Atlas AI. And uh, with, the, we, with the partnership we've formed with Atlas AI, they will bring satellite imaging to the ground data that we are building at Agra and in different countries that we are working in. And combining this information, they are able to give us predictive analytics on poverty, on crop yields, on things that we have not seen before. So what we're trying to do is to try to make sure that we can support these countries to reduce the cost of accessing data to bring it home to these countries to be able to have a sense of what is going to happen, especially given climate change, have a sense of what is going to happen, have a sense of how to plan. Most of these countries uh, uh, have trade barriers that are built from just lack of visibility of what's happening in their landscape. They are putting trade bans where they don't need to put trade bans. And imagine you put a trade ban on a farmer that was just waiting for that harvest to come so that he can sell and get school fees for his kid. So, so, so really working with Atlas AI is going to open up space for us in terms of understanding the climate itself, understanding the, the economics of production, but also uh, the, the how, how produce is coming out at the end of the season and how governments get to plan better. One other thing I wanted to mention, from a technology perspective, in Africa, things still move by word of mouth, right? Farmers adopt things because they ha they've had another farmer doing something. Now, the telephone and working with the telephone, you, you're beginning to see a lot more of 
word of telephone, right? Because now 70% of African farmers have a telephone, and in a few days, more than 100% of these farmers will have access to a telephone. So now you can actually see farmers adopting like insurance, crop insurance, and other small packages because the, they are seeing from the, the farm, other farmers are telling them, that, oh, I got this over the telephone, and this is what it told me, and this is what I did, and I didn't lose my crop, or when I lost my first planting, I was given another pack. So there's adoption of technologies happening much faster because we are actually able to link into uh, what, what is happening from big data perspective that is being passed on to smallholder farmers through technology. So <coughs> really huge opportunities there. Yeah, but I'm glad you highlighted that because that's just such a terrific overarching issue. The willingness and speed of adopting innovation has been very low historically. Yeah. And the fact that technology is speeding that up, as well as being a tool that can accelerate farming practices is great. So Ushi, you've been using big data in some different ways um, that I'd love to hear about. And I also tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing in appropriate farming tools. So one of the things that as a company we need to do is to produce a lot of seed. Uh, which we sell afterwards. So we have roughly 60,000 farmers who on any given season will grow seed for us, bring it back to our processing plants, which we then uh, analyze for quality before it goes back into the market. So we wanted to see, um, uh, develop um, digital tools which we could share with our farmers, uh, the production farmers. And so the farmer has information as well as the company. So we uh, develop different, um, different tools uh, which are either for a smartphone or just a mobile device which is not smart, <laughs> super smart. Uh, and one of the things that uh, this um, uh, captures is that it captures uh, what uh, variety the farmer has planted, uh, the date it has been planted, what the weather situation uh, was, how many times the farmer irrigates the crop, if they use any fertilizer, pesticide, uh, all of that gets logged into this app. Uh, if the farmer has a problem during the cropping season, the farmer is able to request, make a service request. Uh, within uh, 24 hours, uh, there is a company rep who uh, visits that farmer from that area to be able to address the problem. Um, it, the most interesting thing that has happened with this app though, so it of course provides a lot of information. All of these fields are geotagged, so you're able to uh, get more satellite data as well, along with what um, on the ground uh, data that you are capturing. But when the seed comes to the farm, uh, comes to the processing unit, typically the farmer would bring them in sacks and uh, you know would wait. Now, when as soon as the bag is delivered to the farm, the farmer gets a message saying that 800 kilo of a seed was delivered to the plant. As soon as the seed gets processed, uh, um, and there is of course some uh, discard which happens from the seed which was delivered, the farmer would again get a message saying that out of the 700 kilos that you delivered, 680 was actually the clean seed. And so the information which gets, uh, uh, the farmer keeps getting, uh, and the time in which the information comes, otherwise in the old days the farmer would come to the plant to try and find out what was it that, uh, what did I bring in? How much was uh, clean? How much passed the quality standard? And as soon as the quality test results are in, the farmer again gets a message saying that uh, your quality standard was met. As a result, the money for that has been deposited with the bank. Now one indirect consequence of this uh, is that the banks now uh, are seeing the farmers getting paid uh, whatever amount consistently and so if the farmer goes to the bank and asks for credit for something, the bank is much more likely to provide uh, that service in terms of extending that credit. So this is a sort of a, um, and the farmer, it's hard for the farmer to believe that as soon as the quality test is done and automatically the payment is made, that less than 24 hours, the money is actually in his or her bank account and they can log into their online uh, banking services and can see that that money is there and on, their, uh, on their smartphones particularly, but the ones who don't have a smartphone can still get the message and know that the money has been I deposited in their bank. Now the other thing, other element in this app is that the farmer is wanting to know what is the market price. So if you 
uh, if they've harvested five tons um, of wheat, they want to know what is the market price. So this app also provides, so there are five different mondays near the farmer, and it'll say that at this monday, the, uh, the per kilo price is 180 rupees. At this place, it's 182 rupees. So the farmer can then make choices as to which market they will take their produce uh, to sell. The third thing which the app does, uh, and before I, before I forget, uh, all of this, uh, these apps are in local languages. So the it will be either in Marathi, Hindi, uh, Tamil, or Telugu, and so the farmer has, it's very easy for the farmer uh, to use these, um, these uh, applications. The last thing that the farmer can also request on this is that services. So farmer says, my wheat is ready for harvest, do you have a, a harvester which I can request service for? So uh, the price is also given to the farmer that if the harvester comes, it'll be 300 rupees per acre or it'll be uh, whatever, 10% of the produce, depending on who the service provider is. So the app actually provides all of this um, vendor data to the farmer. The farmer can see uh, who is willing to come, how quickly they can come, and what services are available. So we've seen a lot of excitement for the farmers for these digital applications, and I have um, just shared the production farmer data, but similar applications we've developed also for our commercial farmers. That's great. So there's been talk for many years about sustainable intensification among smallholders, and I think it's so exciting to hear that digitization is in many ways making farmers more efficient, giving them more tools to target the right crops, to manage weather events, to really make a significant leap forward in that direction. I wanna come back, Agnes, to the role of government because I know that collaborating with government and influencing policy is something that AGRA works on very significantly. It, could you give us an example of a case where you've gotten government to change policy in some way that has been very significant for the farmers so that it, people get a sense of well, you know, what are the policy challenges and what is the impact they can have? Okay, good. Um, so at the end of the day in Africa, most of the resources that shape how agriculture function, probably 70% of those resources are still sitting with government, right? So you want government to really prioritize agriculture. And you will see that in countries where agriculture has been prioritized, whether it is Ethiopia, um, whether it is Kenya, whether it is Burkina Faso or Rwanda, these countries have, in, in for them, agriculture is either number one or among the first four uh, priorities that the country is pursuing. And what happens when that happens is it informs subsequent policies under that. It informs the type of investments that are going to happen. Is it going to be smallholder driven? Is it going to be large scale farmer driven? Is it going to be cash crop driven? Is, is it going to be staple crop driven? So that is extremely important. Now when you look at um, a country like, uh, we work in 11 countries and in each of these countries, we uh, one thing I must say, policy and making policy is still one of the biggest challenges that the continent has. Yep. Because uh, policy is, 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 a, is a whole spectrum of you have a policy in place, then you have instruments of the policy, and then you put in place mechanism of regulating how that policy works. So it's one of the biggest challenges that the continent faces. So in terms of how we, we see, uh, how, where we have influenced policy, I mean, we, we've worked with the government of Ghana, for example, to, to help them understand that seed businesses cannot function if the policy on seed does not favor seed businesses to be, to be able to actually operate optimally. So for example, most of our countries have a policy where um, we have subsidies and governments are actually directly purchasing seeds and fertilizers and supplying them to farmers for free, right? That type of environment kind of really makes it difficult for businesses to operate. So one of the things we've been doing is we, we try to help them understand that we have actually, as Agra, we have actually invested in creating seed businesses so that we can reduce the distance to the farmer in a private sector oriented manner. And now these businesses are in place. So I can understand 15 years ago, when we had the 2008 food crisis, why you would go in and start supplying free seed, but today we now have a business environment and we need to step aside 
and ensure that the business environment is working. So we negotiate with the countries, and again, I, I would say in Ghana, we've been particularly successful in telling the country, and look, we have over 10 businesses in seed that are suffocated by how your, your policy is working. And the government sat and listened to us, and they decided to re reconfigure their policy to actually provide forward uh, contracts to, to, to seed businesses so that they can start producing with a view of what the market is. They had just decided to stop participating in, in, the, in, the, in the business. And, and we were trying to show the government how once the government runs out of resources to provide free seed, there won't even be a private sector to talk about because the private sector is dying in the process. So um, in that case, the Ghana government removed the, the, the they get the, um, provided forward contracts to seed businesses, and seed businesses are now back into, into the, the landscape of things and are trying to work. And, and you see this in, nearly in every country, but if you go, to, for example, to Ethiopia, Ethiopia was, is, for them, agriculture is number one in terms of <coughs> priority sectors. And to be able to move agriculture forward, they actually did this massive landscape mapping of soils so that they can understand what their soils are like. And in, in fact, this has meant that because Ethiopia is very intentional around soil fertility management, they use blends. It's like a national thing, they use blends. And Ethiopia is actually the only country in Sub-Saharan Africa that is producing about five metric tons on average per hectare of maize because they are combining availability of seeds for farmers with blended fertilizers, soil, you know, f soil fertility management, but with extension. They superimpose really intense extension on that. And as a result, they're producing about five metric tons per hectare. I mean, Ethiopia had a food crisis, had a, a major drought a few years ago, but nobody heard about it the way we had, we had what happened when, when Ethiopia was, had massive starvation. Because they're in charge now, and they've prioritized uh, agriculture's part of their, it's number one policy in terms of how they do business. So it's extremely important. Great, yeah. and I, I'm so appreciative that several of you are mentioning, mentioning soil health, which is one of my pet topics, um, <coughs> because as Agnes just mentioned, when you manage soil health, first of all, you minimize the impact of climate change, you minimize the carbon that goes into the atmosphere, you increase the resilience in situations of drought, and you raise productivity. Soil health is the foundation, I think, of our ability to respond sustainably to the situation that we face. And yet, many farmers and many countries have not paid any attention to it. So it's exciting to hear that so many people are beginning to put it on the priority list. And it's related to my last question for you, Usha, which is, what should we be measuring to ensure that short-term gains, we know how to get short-term gains in production. We can dump a bunch more fertilizer on things and a bunch more water and we can grow more. Um, we can use lots of pesticides in the short run, we can move the needle and that's not sustainable in the long run. And so how should we be balancing the short-term and the long-term and what should we be measuring to ensure mm -hmm. a balanced approach. Great. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, when we talk about the smallholder farmer, the number one priority for the smallholder farmer is increasing income. And that really puts it in that short term uh, goal for the farmer is that how do I make sure that I survive the season, have a little surplus uh, to be able to continue on with farming. So in this case, uh, from a long-term gains perspective, uh, it's very, very important that we address the short-term need of the farmer uh, so that the farmer is very keen and interested in participating in the long-term objective of sustainability. Um, one uh, example is the government's intervention. Uh, I would take it at two different levels. One, uh, the government of India announced that they would offer uh, free soil testing services uh, farm le at farm level so that the entire country's uh, soil health card uh, is developed and uh, then appropriate recommendations can be made uh, so that uh, the farmer uh, pr uh, does practices which either improve uh, the soil health or use practices of 
um, uh, micro irrigation, for instance, which again uh, reduce dependency on some of the natural resources. So um, when we uh, when we talk about um, the farmer livelihood uh, and farmer choices, uh, I think the farmer choices are really driven by markets. And one example in that that I wanted to share is uh, relating to sorghum. Uh, if we look historically at the sorghum cultivation in India, which is a very appropriate crop for the agroecology in India, because it's uh, drought tolerant, we use it as a, uh, in many areas, we use the sorghum grain for bread making. And so it used to be a very, very popular crop uh, for the farmers to grow. But the market prices kept going down and also some changes in the consumer pref preference, which reduced the acreage from almost 20 million acres to less than 10 million acres over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Now, one intervention that the, farm, uh, the government did was to increase um, the minimum support price that it offered to the farmer. As soon as that minimum support price was offered, the sorghum acreage uh, uh, not quite doubled, but increased significantly because there was a market linkage. And so this farm choice, uh, the farmer's choice is really linked to the market demand uh, and uh, the prices that they're going to get. So it still comes back um, uh, to, the, uh, to the point about short-term focus uh, <coughs> where it, we need to look at what is, uh, what is it that government policy can do to encourage longer-term uh, sustainability uh, and um, the, um, uh, the farm profitability is a measure, I feel, for long-term sustainability that in my mind is critical that we must look at and see. Uh, in terms of technology, uh, and access of farmer to different services is another indication of how the farmers are doing in terms of their economic welfare. Uh, because uh, technologies, uh, many, many cases are scale neutral, and so you would have access to technology for the farmer, uh, indicates that the farmer is doing better, and in which case the farmer is willing to invest in, in uh, tools uh, as uh, drip irrigation is one example where a farmer invest in drip irrigation if they have a little bit more disposable income. So uh, access and implementation of technology at farm level is another measure which I feel is indicative of the farmer's willingness to invest in these. So I want to give you guys a chance to ask some questions. And before anyone starts, I'd like to plead with you to be succinct in your questions and Refrain from giving speeches in consideration of your fellow audience members. Okay, let's go to the gentleman in the hat in the second row. Um, hello, that was very interesting. We farm in West Africa. Um, so uh, one of the biggest issues that we've encountered is uh, this ex rural exodus uh, from the youth especially. Could you talk about um, how you are dealing with that and has um, sort of the digitalization and access to um, data, um, has that enticed the youth to actually go back to farming because there's something now a bit sexier around it? Um, great question. I'll, I'll first highlight that that teleagric center that I mentioned the average age of the agronomist extension is working in the, uh, all of whom are children of farming families, was probably 25 years old. Uh, so definitely the, the entrepreneurial platform that an agricultural business provides for young people to maybe not be their father's and mother's farms, but a new uh, business-oriented approach to both the production and also the aggregation is, is exciting. Um, I'll mention we have a experience around what we call talent partnerships and apprenticeships, where we're, we're taking uh, graduate students from, this is really more city to rural, but graduate students in say accounting or, or um, ag um, agricultural uh, technology and placing them into these agricultural businesses for a year long practicum to inspire young people to get um, hip to <coughs> the opportunity that agriculture provides. Um, and I just think in general taking farming as much more of a business, kind of a, a, an entrepreneurial venture versus traditional approach to farming is, is a, of course, a rock bed of that. We see, so, sorry, may I add? Yeah. 
we're seeing a lot of young people staying in farming, uh, in particularly in high value crops. So if they see uh, horticultural crops, for instance, in my region in Maharashtra, we're seeing more young people between the age of 20 and 25 uh, coming back to agriculture and focusing on uh, farming such as pomegranate because they feel there is a market, uh, market for it or growing mangoes, but not interested in growing your staple crops because uh, profitability is the big driver there. And I think that is what, in addition to having information and knowledge with the digital applications that we have, uh, this, this element of profitability is what is driving those farmers. Farmers are more willing to go cilantro or coriander on their, on their farm because it gives them much more of a bottom line than if they were growing sorghum. In Kenya, you see, um, you see actually people who have office jobs like myself go to farm as a secondary uh, business because there's an opportunity to, gain, gain, to get more income by farming because there's a huge market coming from a six million people market sitting right there. There's a huge opportunity there. I think th you will always see exodus if you expect people to come to farm as labor, just for the sake of labor. It's not going to happen today. I, uh, those that are going to farm as labor are already farming on their own land. And we've now, we now know that 50% of African farmers are below 35, which is the number that actually people sometimes find difficult to believe. Mm -hmm. Those are already farming. Think of all the people that leave school after primary school, that leave school after secondary school. They go and farm. You're talking about the people that leave school after university, the 10 people who, who of, of which only three get a job. Those seven don't want to get a job as labor. Those will always go away. So I think it's also how we structure farming. And we are seeing more and more of those people going back to farming to, to manage an irrigation kit, to sell technologies to farmers, to use the mobile telephone, to do agriculture, but from uh, mobile telephone, being able to tell you, oh, your soil lacks this, or this disease is that. They're interested in that type of farming. They're not going to be interested in providing labor on the farm. Yeah, right here. And could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, is it working? Yes. I'm, I'm Sarah Shear from Eco Agriculture Partners. And I, I know the work of, of, uh, of AGRA and, and Root Capital for a long time and tremendously admire the work they're doing. And I've learned about the cool work that USHA is doing. But I really feel like I'm hearing only part of the picture, especially given Deborah's introduction. Um, these are necessary activities and with huge potential, but they don't seem to be at all sufficient given the reality of massive resource degradation that's going on in Africa right now. And what we're working with at Eco Agriculture Partners are these landscape scale partnerships where farmers organizations and agribusiness are partnering with water agencies and NGOs working on biodiversity and these kinds of things to deal with actually reducing the risks of climate change by building large scale rainwater harvesting structures or restoring biodiversity in highly degraded areas. And these kinds, I'm just not hearing anything here from what you're saying, and I'm wondering if you can say more about how we can get other sectors within these agricultural landscapes absolutely on board with re restoring um, the resource base that's needed, reducing the risks for agriculture in this context of climate change. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Who would like to reply? Yeah. I, let me just give you an example of what I saw in Rwanda. One, like I said, Rwanda is a highly stressed environment because of high population, small country and highly mountainous, so really stressed. But we were not shy <coughs> to, you know, China a while ago did something called the ret restoration of the Lost Plateau, which is bigger than the size of France, part of China, that they restored completely back to, to functionality, uh, uh, part of the country that was completely degraded. We've actually done similar work. We've restored, because of, uh, of the nature of Rwanda, we've had an influx of people who had always lived as refugees, myself as one of them, who came back to Rwanda and added to the stress that the country was having. So at some point, we had to completely remove people from land and just go into restoration. And believe you me, we were able to reconstitute, to get back into vegetation or into forest, 27% of the land that was completely lost was restored back into um, agricultural, pro uh, I mean, into, into just landscapes, functional landscapes. And, and agricultural productivity in lands that were no longer productive went up hugely because we were able to go back into 
soil fertility management, composting, reconstituting soils. And for me, this is a live example of how you deal with major issues around restoration of land, around climate change. And we are also dealing with now better varieties, right? Uh, we have Simit has an unbelievable number of varieties that, we are, that need 30% less water and those are being used, ensuring that farmers have no need to do more land. And we are seeing that in parts of Kenya where we are preventing uh, deforestation by just ensuring that farmers are producing more with the land they have. And, and, and <coughs> more and more of that is beginning to happen. A lot of attention now is being paid to the fact that people need to stop producing more by moving into more land and, and focus really on producing more by better soil fertility management and using crop varieties that are more suited to those environments and can produce better. So I, it's already happening. We probably going, didn't go into the details of that, but we can't survive without doing that, given where we are at today. Well, yeah, Martin. Yeah, hi, Martin from Kickstart, promoting smallholder irrigation across Africa. Um, and you're talking about adaption to climate change and weird weather, lack of rains, droughts. We're talking about intensification. We're talking about increased incomes. And in Africa, that's only going to come if we can do multi-cropping throughout the year and avoid it when the rain and be able to still grow when the rains fail. And that's only going to come through on-farm water management and irrigation. Yet there's no talk of that on stage here from Africa. We've heard a bit about India, but India's already 48% irrigated. Sub-Saharan Africa, less than 4% um, of farmlands irrigated. Um, so that's one point I just want to get some feedback on. The second one is we're talking about um, value chains and selling into big companies. 90% of smallholder farmers in Africa are never going to sell to big companies in the value chains. They're going to sell to their neighbors, their local uh, uh, middle women and middle men who are going to sell into the local markets. Um, and so how do we tackle those when we're talking about working with big industry and big companies? That's not going to hit them. So if you want to talk about the small scale irrigation, you can talk about how you're going to fund them, right? <laughs> so the, s the small scale uh, irrigation, um, we, we now call it, we want to refer to it as farmer led irrigation, not small scale irrigation. Because again, it will depend on how much the farmer, how much land the farm has access to and how much he wants to be part of a market depending on what market he has access to. That is becoming, I mean, Africa for a long time has been pushing for large scheme irrigations, m worried more about global at country level, global food security than individual food security. Now it's becoming increasingly clear that food is going to have to be secured at household level. And so farmer-led irrigation is now the center of the conversation. My worry is that you don't have enough pumps or, or that you're not, <laughs> what, what I try to encourage people to do is how can we start creating businesses in the landscapes where the businesses are needed so that the service to water, like Usha was saying, is something that you don't have to worry about. I just send you a message, I need water here. And in 10 minutes, I have someone be able to provide me water. What we are, before I came here, I was having a, a discussion with the World Bank, again, recognizing that these institutions have huge funds through countries that can impact how these things are accessed. My biggest worry is the actual source of water. What is the, going to be the actual source of water for every farmer to be able to have farmer irrigation? And how is that water resource going to be managed? So we have to worry about that from a landscape perspective. And we, we are right now having those conversations around, let's talk about the, the larger picture in terms of source of water and then the management of that so that we worry about what tomorrow looks like. But I think the idea of farmer irrigation is going to have to be tomorrow's reality. Mm. So maybe I just, this is a reminder, Sarah and Martin, uh, humbling and powerful it is to be with a group who see the entire mosaic landscape mosaic, all the different needs. But I would just say, um, in defense of not myopic approaches, but very specialized approaches that over time can come together and you know address, you know, if you're gonna eat a whale, take a first bite. Um, DFID published a, kind of a refresh on their agricultural, you know, the USAID of the UK or the other way around, um, <laughs> that basically laid out the future of agriculture to over stylize things. There are 500 million small scale farmers in the world roughly and um, there are three paths forward. One is stepping out, out of agriculture into other jobs, whether it's service industry, manufacturing, smaller cities, etc. Thing two is hanging in. <laughs> hanging in 
subsistence farming or maybe just above that, better yield, better productivity, feed the family for the next two or three generations. And the other step is into transformational agriculture, which is really building an agri-food business. And in our case, like the vision is, again, we're a tiny little piece of it, but tens of thousands of agricultural businesses that form the thriving backbone of an agricultural sector that build resilient, inclusive, prosperous communities. So you can't do it all at the same time, but you have no excuse not to say, okay, as we focus on, um, on agro processors, grain millers, grain traders, in addition to say the sustainable tree crops like cashew or macadamia nut, et cetera, do it in consortium with the other folks who are seeing the bigger picture on the landscape. And how do you scale up um, water irrigation? Well, one of the ways is that you have an aggregator with offtake being a local agro-processor that provides a, a way to buy in bulk the treadle pumps so that they can be distributed without having to rely on NGO funding for it. So it's, you know, in other words, you know, total gotcha moment, yes, and we gotta like just bring it all together incrementally. <laughs> can we do it fast enough? We'll see. Accelerate. There you go. Yeah. Gary. Thank you. But there's another path out of agriculture, right? The other path out of agriculture is if each of these farmers the, the part that I talked about, smallholder farmers being the businesses, it's a reality. I mean, I grew up on a smallholder farm and we were 15 kids. Mm -hmm. None of us is a smallholder <coughs> farmer because we were able to get an education. So that land now belongs to someone else. So there's a real path out of, of, of smallholder farming by really creating a uh, path into modern society and all sorts of other jobs. Uh, Gary Cohn, uh, Healthcare Without Harm. Uh, if this was in another venue, and the topic was still how do we feel, uh, feed 10 billion people on a warming planet, uh, there would be a lot of discussion about genetic engineering. And in the last year, there's a lot of research that's come out that Monsanto's Roundup is a carcinogen, there's lawsuits. I haven't heard anybody talk about what's the role of genetic engineering or is there a role in feeding 10 billion people on a warming planet? Fisher, I think that's your question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, we were talking earlier and actually, um, uh, so the company that I work with uh, does uh, work on genetically modified crops. Uh, cotton is the big crop in India and we also have developed a product which is uh, being grown in Bangladesh, uh, BT eggplant. Um, so GMOs uh, and now of course gene edited products uh, which are likely to come. Uh, it, in our view, uh, form a very important uh, element of the toolbox. So when we talk about uh, developing new varieties, uh, new uh, hybrids or improved uh, material that the farmer will plant, uh, we use this toolbox which in starts from conventional plant breeding going all the way to gene editing. So depending on what the need is and what solutions are available, we feel that GMOs and gene edited products definitely should be part of the toolbox and available. And uh, there are things which uh, are not possible to do uh, by non, um, by uh, conventional means, in which case uh, we should definitely use uh, these new tools to develop products which bring value to the farmer. And so to push you a little further, um, I think one of the concerns coming from an environment like the US is that particularly Monsanto, the big evil company that's been associated with this. I put evil in italics, but that's sort of their reputation in the US these days. Um, the concern is that they've promoted things like Roundup Ready seed as totally benign and great for the environment. And many, 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 many years down the road, it becomes clear that no, that really isn't true. Pollinators are being killed. All kinds of bad outcomes are occurring. And so I guess the question is, what things are you doing in your company in terms of testing and creating safeguards to ensure, I mean, this is the long-term, short-term trade-off um, to ensure that the use, because clearly a GMO is not a GMO. There are many different ways to modify. Some are benign, some probably not. What are the things you're doing to minimize or eliminate the really bad outcomes that we've seen? Right. 
So one of the key elements uh, for uh, any product development uh, and for a company who wants to stay in business for the coming 100 years, hopefully, or more, is to make sure that the product is safe. Uh, it, and it, do it doesn't matter which uh, technology it uses to bring that product, but a product is uh, safe, it's, uh, it's appropriate for the local conditions, and that it is a high priority for the pharma. So uh, when we uh, talk about safety, um, uh, of course, in case of GMOs, the safety guidelines are laid out uh, very clearly by the government in terms of what is expected. There are significant um, institutional as well as uh, central government level regulations which uh, govern that. So within the company, uh, one of the <coughs> things that we always uh, try and do is to first say if the problem is uh, water use efficiency, uh, what are the different options which are available to us uh, to try and address that? So if I can uh, develop a product using molecular breeding, uh, which is non-GMO, uh, I can, uh, then my preference is to go that route. Because if I, as soon as I develop a GMO product, I have a 10-year regulatory compliance requirement. So uh, if you really think about a GMO product uh, and the amount of testing that we are doing on that to prove safety uh, is no other agricultural product in the history of agriculture has been tested as extensively as a GMO product for safety. <laughs> so it's an interesting element. Human safety and environmental safety? Human environmental safety as well as uh, food and feed, yeah. So, uh, so th this is, um, uh, so you look at the alternatives, uh, what are the options which are available? And if GMO, like, like in case of a BT eggplant, where there was no known source of resistance for the lepidopteran pest which attacks the brinjal eggplant fruit, then uh, developing the BT brinjal was a good option. And in, the, in which case we went through uh, different levels of toxicity uh, assessments as well as uh, food and feed quality assessments, and of course agro agronomic performance before the product actually has been released uh, it to be cultivated in Bangladesh. Uh, India is still uh, to approve the product for cultivation. So I have one thing. Um, really important issue, and sometimes we miss the point, becomes kind of a straw man or straw woman that gets beat, beaten to death. The big issue um, in many landscapes, let's take sorghum, where I think in Africa, you'll know the data better than I, but in certain countries where you have, say, the breweries who are selling low price point beer, based on sorghum and displacing expensive inputs or um, I imports of barley and hops, et cetera, you have a lot more sorghum production in recent years than you used to. More nutritious food for local families and a lot more income. Um, and it happens to be highly drought, uh, drought tolerant. Um, it's about a hybrid seed that's not genetically depleted because they're heirlooms that have been used year after year after year after year. And simply introducing the hybrid seed in a way where you can scale it up far away from GMOs is an enormous challenge, but it's a great opportunity. Right. So it's like, I feel like it's often like this binary thing, but there's kind of the continuum along the way in itself is actually where a lot of um, what's happening needs to like proliferate. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's, that is a huge discussion in and of itself, which given that our time yeah. has elapsed, I'm sad to say we're not going to get into and we're not going to be able to take any more questions. Um, to wrap up, this is a very big topic, as was appropriately pointed out by Sarah, when we look at the full issues of restoring depleted landscapes and remediation, and we've only scratched the surface on many things. I hope you've gotten a better picture of some of the challenges, but also of the many areas of progress that give us a foundation to work from with many smallholders who are now digitally enabled, who are more enthusiastic about accessing a variety of tools using those digital platforms that they have, who are focused on restoring soil health. So the picture is not entirely bleak, the urgency is very high. There are technologies that are needed that do not exist. 
Some of these guys are developing them. If you are in a situation where you have an opportunity to contribute to the future of food and ag, I think there are many exciting areas to do that in, in both of these landscapes and others in the Global South. So thanks again for participating in this session, and I hope you have a great rest of the forum.